What did one wall say to the other? I'll meet you at the corner. <laughs> you know, inflation is, it's, it's getting pretty out of hand, but that's just my five cents. <laughs> What's red and smells like blue paint? Red paint, there you go. <laughs> I'm really excited for the autopsy club I just joined. Tuesday's open mic night. <laughs> if you see how it's spelled, you'd get it right away. So. All right, we've been in a series called Jesus Encounter. Sometimes I do my notes, I type my sermon up, and I'm like, I don't know if this is any good. You know, we'll, we'll find out on Sunday morning. But I read my notes this morning, I'm like, I think this one's good. So we've been in a series called Jesus Encounter. Um, we've been focusing on the person, the power, the anointings of the Lord Jesus, and the various roles and titles of the Lord Jesus. Ephesians 1.17, Paul says this to the, to the church in Ephesus. He says, I pray that the Father of glory... The God of our Lord Jesus Christ would impart to you the riches of the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation that you may know him through your deepening intimacy with him. We need a spirit of wisdom and revelation to go deeper in our intimacy with the Lord. Why are we studying and focusing on the names and the roles of the Lord Jesus? Because we want to learn more about him. But we're asking the Holy Spirit, not, just this would be, not that this would just be head knowledge, but that God would translate this into heart knowledge and that we would go deeper with the Lord. Part one was called Jesus, our Messiah. Part two is called Jesus, our God. He's not just divine. He is divinity. Uh, part three was called Jesus, the man. He is our perfect representative before God, and he is God's perfect representative um, to us from heaven. The title of our message today is called Jesus, our Lord. Here's the deal. Jesus is the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians, 1, um, 1 Corinthians 2, 7 says this, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God has destined for our glory before time began. Come on, isn't that cool? God destined us for your glory before time even began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Jesus is the Lord of glory, and there will be a future event that will prove to everyone that he is the Lord of glory. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says this. This is the amplified version, so I'll say it really loud. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. For this reason also, because he obeyed and was so completely, and so completely humbled himself, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in submission of those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess and openly acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, the sovereign God, to the glory of God the Father. Okay, there is coming a, a, an event, a future event, where every knee, will, uh, every knee will bow, every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. So here's my question for you today, to kind of kick this off. Maybe you know him as your savior, I hope you do. Maybe you know him as teacher, I hope you do. Maybe you know him as the advocate, Emmanuel, God with us. Maybe you know him as your great high priest. Maybe you know Jesus as a prophet, a mediator, the Lamb of God, the Good Shepherd, the way, the truth, the life, the Prince of Peace, the living water. He is all those things, and they're all amazing revelations that we need to have of him. But my question to you today is, do you know him as Lord? That is, are you under the Lordship of of Jesus? Does he have lordship in your lives? When the fullness of the expression of the Lord's name is given, it's presented like this, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is his human name. Christ is his office, prophet, priest, and king, and Lord is his title. 
I want to talk about the lordship of Jesus in our lives and what that lordship produces in us and through us when, we, when he is our Lord. It's possible to be a believer, a follower of Jesus, but not be submitted to the lordship of Jesus. Uh, the main text we're going to focus on uh, today will be Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Um, this used to be um, one of my favorite, it was my favorite uh, verse in the Bible. It's still one of my favorites, but it says this. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Now, something about this verse might catch your attention, and that is this. Apparently, there are two things that that Paul mentions here. To the, to the to believers in Rome, these aren't these aren't unbelievers. He's writing the book of Romans, written to believers in Rome. There's two things he says are needed to be saved: belief and confession. And when you do those two things, you'll be saved. Now, what might catch your attention about that is that there is a, a dual requirement to be saved, which actually goes against what some other scriptures say about salvation. For example. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, whosoever shall believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16 does not have a dual requirement for salvation. It just has one requirement, believe in, right? Acts 16.31, they, they, they asked the apostles, well, what must we do to be saved? They said this, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. Okay, one requirement, belief. Ephesians 2.8.9, uh, this is, Another one of Paul's um, epistles written to the, the church in Ephesus. He said this, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So Paul says over here, there's one requirement, and over in Romans he says there's a dual requirement. But over and over we see scriptures that only have one requirement to be saved. Believe. But in Romans 10, 9, we're told there's two things we have to do, believe and openly confess. Well, which is it? Do we need to just do one thing, believe, or is there a dual requirement to salvation? Come back next week and I'll tell you. No. (laughs) Here's what you need to know. The word saved has three different tenses that can be applied to it. Okay, how many know that um, we were saved from the past penalty of our sins? We will be saved in the future from the very presence of sin, and we are being saved now from the present power of sin. So we were saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. Does this make sense? We were saved from the penalty of sin, we're being saved from the present power of sin, and we will be saved from the very presence of sin altogether. The word saved here is used to describe all three instances, um, past, present, and future. And and in fact, the the word there, the Greek word is sozo, and sozo itself is used in other applications besides heaven. Um, The word sozo is saved, healed, and delivered. In some instances in the Bible, someone was healed, and and Jesus, I believe is a woman um, with the issue of blood, Jesus said, your faith has sozoed you, your faith has, uh, has made you well. Uh, you got healed because of your faith. Same word, salvation. Your faith has saved you. Um, so in some cases, it's, it's talking about heaven. In some cases, it's talking about deliverance. In some cases, it's talking about healing. So there's three tenses, and then there's different applications to the word saved. So understanding the tense will help you unpack the verse. And that's what we're going to do here in Romans uh, chapter uh, 10, verse 10. Romans 10 gives us a hint to what it's talking about here. So it says this, for it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. Okay. That's clearly talking about faith righteousness. When we believe we are an imputed righteousness, God gives us, he counts it um, towards us as righteous when we believe. And then it goes on, Romans 10, 10, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Okay, I want to suggest to you today that Paul is not exclusively talking about going to heaven here. He's not exclusively talking about being saved from 
the very presence of sin in a future event. Is it possible that declaring the Lord Jesus openly has to do with not getting you to heaven, but bringing heaven to you? Okay. Being saved from the present power of sin. So Paul is not exclusively talking about being saved from the penalty of sin past. And Paul is not exclusively talking about being saved from the very presence of sin future. But Paul is highlighting to us one of the keys from being saved from the present power of sin in our everyday lives. It's confession. Paul is teaching us how to be free from sin and sin's agents. Sin has three different agents that it works through. The, the world, worldliness, the flesh, that is our carnal nature, and the devil. Faith in Jesus releases grace to be saved, right? Faith in Jesus grace to be saved. But confession of the Lord Jesus releases grace to be free from sin's present power. Here's my question for you today. Are you openly acknowledging and living for Jesus? Or are you a closet Christian? We got some closet Christians, don't we? Here's the deal. Closet Christians are more likely to have closet problems. But public Christians are more likely to live in victory. Amen? If you put that, uh, if you come through our uh, new members, newcomers night and become a member and you put that sticker on your car, you're more likely not to cut people off, I hope. (laughs) Right? Publicly declaring your faith actually releases grace in our lives to be free from the present power of sin. Okay, now some of you don't believe me. I'm going to illustrate this in a couple other verses here. Uh, Revelation 12, 11 uh, Revelation, of course, is, a, is an apocalyptic book about events in the end times. This applies certainly to us, but it's talking about um, saints that are in the, um, in the last days. It says this, um, Satan and his angels fell to the earth and, um, and are on this earth. And it says, and they defeated him, that's talking about the devil, and they defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. They did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Okay. The blood of the lamb, that's what Jesus did for us, right? What did we do there? We believe. That's what we do with the blood of the lamb. And it says, though, they also overcame, or you could even supplement the word, were saved. They overcame uh, by their public confession of faith. That is the word of their testimony. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, how many know that your testimony is useless unless you testify? Your testimony doesn't do any good unless you're testifying, okay? Some of you haven't told your testimony in a while and haven't been testifying. So here we see in this verse in Revelation, we, have, we see victory over the devil through public acknowledgement of the Lord Jesus. That is definitely living public, that they, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, not loving their lives so much as that they were afraid to die. Listen, that's public living right there. They were, they were so open about it, and they, knew there's a, they know there's a threat on their life, and they don't care. That's, that's public acknowledgement, and they overcame through those circumstances. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Victory over the devil through public acknowledgement of Lord Jesus, what he has done in you and through you. Let me, let me show you another verse that has a, uh, a dual condition of salvation. Mark 16, 16, this, this, this verse used to bother me. It says this, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Okay, what's up with this verse? Uh, do you have to be baptized to be saved? Well, we don't teach that here, and, and as far as I can tell, most Protestant believers don't teach that, you, that it is a mandatory requirement for you to be water immersed in order for you to go to heaven. Now, doesn't this contradict the other verses that say it's, in, it's by faith alone and Christ alone that gets you to heaven? Okay? Here's the deal. The believing part is about faith righteousness, which does get you to heaven. But could the water baptized part be talking about being saved from the present power of sin? Okay? After all, what is water baptism? Water baptism is your public profession of your faith. There are other things that happen in the water as a baptism. There's significant 
um, symbolism there, of course. But water baptism is your public acknowledgement, your pu public confession of faith. It's the word of your testimony going public. And according to Colossians 2, we have victory over sin through water baptism. Okay? Um, Colossians 2 talks about circumcision of the heart, the cutting away of the sinful nature. In the, in the Old Testament, um, you participated in the covenant um, um, through circumcision. That was, that, was the, that was the outward sign of the inward reality. There was an outward sign that, that the transformation that happened in your heart, that you, were, that you were the Lord's. So that's how men participate in the covenant and women participate in the covenant by either A, being married to a man who was circumcised or living under the household of their father who was circumcised. In the New Testament, it doesn't have to actually do with literal circumcision. It has to do with the circumcision of the heart. Okay, And men and women both undergo a cutting away of the sinful nature. Okay, Where does this happen? Watch this, Colossians 2.11. It says this, In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Question, when did that happen? When did the cutting of the sinful nature um, happen? Colossians 2.12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Okay? Baptism is your public confession of faith. And there actually, um, I don't believe it's only a symbolic thing of what happened when I came to faith. I do believe there's a supernatural element to water baptism. If you've never been water baptized, you need to do it. Um, number one, you need to be obedient to lo the Lord. Uh, but number two, I do believe there's a supernatural event that happens in water baptism, and that is you are severed from the old nature. You are severed from the old man. Okay? Your public, in your public confession of faith, God did a supernatural work in your heart. Question, do you need to be water baptized to go to heaven? I don't believe you do. But to get heaven into you, it's part of being a Christ follower. To be saved from the present power of sin, your um, public confession is important. Now listen, bapti baptism, water baptism, is a one-time event, but living publicly for the Lord should be an ongoing process. Um, your baptism was supposed to be your inauguration to your public Christian life. It was supposed to be your introduction to your public proclamation. And I think a lot of believers, they, they get saved, yay, they get water baptized, public, but then they go back in the closet. <laughs> and then they secretly struggle with things in the closet. Listen, part of living free is living public. Going public with your faith and then living public from then on out. There's something about it that releases grace in our lives. Baptism was supposed to set a pattern for you to continue to live publicly for Jesus. We're never supposed to go back from that. Amen? Okay, here's the deal. You must believe him to be the Lord to be saved, to get to heaven. But we must confess him as Lord for salvation to do its work in us. That's part of the process of being a believer, is, is confessing him as Lord and living with him as Lord in our lives. This is what I believe Paul is highlighting here in Romans 10, 9. There are a lot of believers who are heaven-bound, but they have no victory in this present world. God wants you to have victory in this present world. God wants you to reign in life, reign in this present world. A lot of people have trusted Christ, but they have not openly confessed him as their Lord to the world or live in a way that continually... What's missing today in many Christians' lives is that they have trusted Christ for heaven, but they have not put themselves under the submission of the Lord Jesus. And if you want victory in your life and overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony, you have to live publicly. Okay, uh, let me give you a another example of this. In John chapter 12, Jesus was doing miracles, and it says that many people didn't believe in him, but some did. So it says this, John 12, 42, Yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith. So they had faith in Jesus, faith in Christ, but they wouldn't publicly acknowledge it for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. This is what keeps a lot of Christians from publicly acknowledging Jesus, for fear. 
Whatever that reason is, persecution. Uh, here's the reason um, in, in uh, John 12, 43. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. Okay? If you're not publicly living for Jesus, not openly living for Jesus, perhaps it is for fear. Perhaps it is because you, you want the praise of men more than you want praise from God. You want the, 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 the um, acknowledgement of the Father, you have to acknowledge Jesus. Jesus actually said that. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. If you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before the Father. Well, listen, in our everyday lives, I want, I want acknowledgement <laughs> from the Father that, that I'm a follower of Jesus. Amen? Here's the deal. You can get saved, that is, you're heaven-bound, privately. I know people who, they heard the gospel, they went home, they're laying on their bed, I know, I know a guy who was laying on his bed at night, and he was thinking about the gospel. His, his girlfriend had told him about the gospel, and he was laying there, and he said, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my life to Christ. I'm going to trust Christ for salvation. He got saved right then and there, laying on his bed at night by himself. He said he felt like he was floating. Okay, you can get saved all alone, no one around you. What do you do? You're simply placing your faith and trust in Jesus. You're acknowledging him. But in order for your faith to work presently, you need to profess his lordship openly. Okay? You can get saved privately, heaven-bound privately, but in order for your faith to work presently, we have to be confessors of him openly. We have to live for him every day of our lives. Now, professing him openly is more than going around saying, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, right? That, there's nothing wrong with that. But professing him openly is actually just living in a way that you let, like uh, Matthew five sixteen, Jesus said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I like the word let there. Let your light shine. In other words, you have the on and off switch here. You, have, you can control it. You can let your light shine or you cannot let your light shine. Um, the name of our church is City Lights Church. And... Um, our premier value is, our first priority, is to minister to the Lord in praise and worship and to encounter his presence. And I knew that going into starting a church, I wanted it to be our premier value. But then I got to thinking about, you know, names for churches and stuff like that. And we thought about, like, what about the dwelling place or the belonging and, you know, these different... And I, I realized that all these names, though they, they were good... Or not good. I don't know. You know, when you're naming a church, you think of a hundred names that are terrible for every one good name. So, but then I got to thinking about it. Um, we wanted a name that wouldn't just convey that we come here and go inward, and that's all we do. Now, listen, coming here and worshiping together and praising together, that is vitally important. That is our first priority. But we don't want to just come in the church and stay inward. We want to go back out into the world and shine the love of Jesus everywhere we go. We want an overflow from our lives. So to minister to the Lord through praise and worship and to encounter his presence in times of worship, it's our first priority, but it's not our only priority. It's our first value, but it's not our only value. It's um, the first thing we do, but it's not the only thing we do, Okay. Because we want to let our light shine before men that may, they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. What are we doing? We want to live publicly for Jesus. We want to shine the love of Jesus everywhere we go. It, everywhere we go. It's more than walking around and saying, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. It's living a life in such a way that people see the fruit in you. They see the life in you. Failure to acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus will often block the supernatural flow of deliverance Remember, Sozo is saved, healed, delivered from our lives. I think many times there's so little deliverance today because there's such a, a, such a lack of submission to the Lordship of Jesus. So my, my challenge for you today is, you know I'm his Savior. You know I'm his teacher. You know him as the Lamb of God. You know him as Emmanuel, God with us. Do you know him as Lord? Not that he is Lord and one day every knee shall bow and tongue confess, but is he, do you, does he exercise lordship over you? Does he exercise lordship over your everyday life? Oh, I want to conclude with this. What does it mean to have Jesus the Lord of your life? Not just Savior, not just the Lamb of God, not just Teacher. What does this lordship look like? 
I have 10 things. And you fill in the blank for you. Number one, it means that if you were accused of being a follower of Jesus Christ, there would be enough evidence to convict you. If you're on trial for being a Christian, there would be overwhelming evidence to convict you of that crime, we'll say. <laughs> Number two, it means you don't just forgive people when you feel like it. Okay, why do we forgive? Well, because we're under the submission of Lord Jesus, and he says forgive. Number three, it means if the Lord wants you to stop listening to a particular type of music, song, whatever, you do. I remember when I was, um, I'll t- I'm going to, yeah, uh, when I was, I think, 16, 17 years old, I was, like, coming back to the Lord. I was kind of, like, rededicating my life. And, you know, sometimes you stumble forward, right? So I still did a lot of really immature things and still do, you know, sometimes. But um, I remember coming back to the Lord. I, I remember I made this commitment. I started going to church again. I was like, I'm going to stop listening to secular music. I'm not saying you have to do that. And I haven't done that forever. But in that particular season, it was important for me to... Um, to just listen to Christian music for a while. And I had my CDs, secular CDs at the time. And I remember driving down the road and I was like, I'm committing to just for a season, I'm only gonna listen to Christian music. And so I had my CDs and I'm like, I threw them out the window. <laughs> Alice in Chains, there you go. Pearl Jam, gone. Nirvana, there you go. You know, it was all this 90s, 90s uh, grunge rock and alternative music. And so, on one hand, here I am, dedicating my Lord. On the other hand, littering the planet. But, okay. <laughs> but at that time, I felt the Lord putting this on my heart. Um, I want you to submit this to me for a season. I, don't want, I want you to only listen to Christian music. That's number three. Uh, number four, it means check why a movie is rated what it is rated before you watch it. And if you start watching a movie and the Holy Spirit says turn it off, you turn it off. Okay. Don't let anything and everything in your eyes. I'm not telling you what movies you can and can't watch. You ask the Holy Spirit to be sensitive to that. He doesn't want you letting anything in your eyes. Number five, it means that you live in a way that acknowledges God. God is watching when no one else sees. When you are all alone, you're home or whatever, no one can see if you're going to steal that thing, look at that thing, do that. You know what I'm saying? You you live your life in a way where you you acknowledge that God sees all the time. It's called the fear of the Lord. Number six, it means that you tell your wanter no when the Lord says no. Number seven, maybe for some of you, it's you need to invite some uh, accountability into what you're watching online. Okay, what do we watch online? Let's invite some accountability into our lives, not to shame us, to call us higher. Amen. Number eight, it means that your financial decisions are submitted to the Lord. Number nine, it means that you live with reverence for God. And number 10, you listen, you know him, you follow him. You listen to him, you know him. There's a verse I read a few weeks ago. My sheep know my voice. They hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Listen, you listen, you know him, we follow him, we obey. Oftentimes, following him is just obedient. I mean, we took communion here just a minute ago, and and some of you had to let him light up some of those shadowy places and remove those mountains that you've built. Amen? It also means this. There's a picture I have. Go Go ahead and put that up. When the Holy Ghost makes you delete the whole text and just reply with, okay. <laughs> That's the Lordship of Jesus. You know, they, uh, this thing has been going around called hand and mouth disease. Is that what it's called? Hand and mouth. How many have ever heard of foot and mouth disease? Guilty. I've done foot and mouth disease many times. Okay. Okay. It means deleting or waiting till the next day to send the email or the text or, you know what I'm saying? Listen to the Holy Spirit before you get yourself in trouble. Been there many times. First Peter 3.15, it says this, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. The word sanctify means set apart. Set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to believers, people who are already believers of Jesus. He's saying, now set Jesus apart as Lord in your hearts. We have a role to play here. 
we have to set him apart. How do we do this? He is Lord, but he must be our Lord. Our Lord. And we must not be afraid to acknowledge him as our Lord publicly. You've been saved by your faith. Now God wants to save you from the present power of darkness and light up your world with the love of Jesus. How do we do that? We live publicly for him. Amen. We light up the world with love of Jesus by living publicly for him. So I'm going to pray and then we'll close. And we're just going to ask the Lord. I'm just going to ask the Lord to speak to you directly. Why don't you guys stand to your feet? And um, ministry team, if you're here, you guys can come down front. And uh, if you need prayer for anything today, we have, these guys are loaded and they're, they're ready to get you. So I'm going to pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. You are Lord of all. And Lord, there's coming a future day when everyone will acknowledge your lordship. But God, I pray that day wouldn't, that we wouldn't find out on that day. We would find out today that you are Lord of all. And we would willingly set apart Christ as Lord in our hearts. We would willingly submit to the lordship of Jesus. And that when we make decisions, we're not just doing them on a whim. We're doing them with the counsel of the Lord. We're doing it with the counsel of the Holy Spirit. We are Christians. We're Christ's followers. And so, Lord, today I just bless your people. I bless this church. I pray, Lord, you would help each of us to submit our ways to you, to be obedient to you. When you, when you tell us to, to pray for someone, to talk to someone, to stop doing something, to start doing something, Lord, I just pray we'd be obedient servants of you, Lord. And I thank you, God, that there's something about that that releases grace to be for the present power of sin to be broken in our lives. Why? Because we're shining everywhere we go, Lord. God, we thank you that you have delivered us from the, um, the past penalty of sin, God. And what awaits us in the future is that you will save us, Lord, from the very presence of sin. But God, I pray in this interim period now, Lord God, we would be delivered from the power of sin. Lord, would you help us to follow your lordship, to be under submission to you. I release that, um, that grace right now in Jesus' name. We love you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, everyone said Amen. All right. God bless you guys.